pardon me, I'm not. This year I had to start wearing readers. <laughs> no old man comments, please. Go <laughs> for All right. Let's see what he is when I trip it out. So, um, just to give you a quick intro before we start the actual video, um, my background, I'm Larry Bartlett. I'm a Fairbanks resident. I've lived in Alaska for 22 years. Um, I started in Alaska. The military brought me up. I served 12 years active duty Army. I was a combat medic and a licensed nurse before I got out. The first five and a half years was a mechanized infantry medic. I served in the Gulf War, came back and changed fields into nursing. They brought me up to Alaska and I spent uh, basically six and a half years at Fort Wainwright um, performing different functions as a nurse, started in labor and delivery, ended in med surge and uh, same day surgery. And during that time, it gave me a lot of opportunity to explore the wilderness. And I, I was a hunter before I came here and it just basically souped me up. I was jazzed and realized that my career path was gonna end in the medical field and I needed to start a new career in the outdoors for a, a lot of different reasons. Uh, some of which you're gonna learn about here today um, the, what, I, what I have accomplished as a hunting expert is uh, really not that important based on what you're going to read. I use that hunting experience to sort of deliver a video to help you not fall asleep with the science that we'll present. Um, I've written a few books, produced a bunch of videos, of innovative products. None of that matters really to what we're uh, dealing with today. So unless you want to know more about my background in the hunting uh, we can talk about that after, but I'd like to just focus on uh, some of the basics of why we brought you here today or what we can offer you in that regard. Uh, one of the biggest things that I took away from my combat experience is the importance of logistics and the weight of my kit and my food kit. And that was always a challenge, even in the late 80s, early 90s. It was worse then than today because of techno technological improvements allow us to kind of reduce our kit and also there are better food choices and we're getting a little smarter with what foods we take to the field. Um, so that's the experience that I bring here today as a, a logistics expert, if you will, more than 20 years experience with trying to always dial in my kit. And as hunters, I think we can all relate to that. Um, that's one thing to remember. And then the other thing is as a nurse, uh, recognizing the alarming trend in our society of obesity and heart disease. And no more, nowhere else is it more prevalent than in the, when you're in a medical establishment and you have to see patients chronically obese and with heart issues and other metabolic processes that really revolve around their diet and their exercise or too much diet and not enough exercise really is what it boiled down to for me. So when I left nursing I used uh, my hunting opportunities to just stay in the field and I created a, a lifestyle that I don't have to work a real job. My real job is what you're about to witness and what I started to realize after about 10 years of that started to get, uh, every two years I would go to my doctor and get a physical. And I was noticing, my doctor was pointing out, it's like, you know, um, the, the biggest things that, that came up were basically I was re a, a reduction in my body fat. Uh, when I left the Army, I was over 200 pounds, around 210, uh, and now I'm about 190 as my normal weight. So that's, that's a significant weight change in 20 years. Um, but what I've noticed is my body fat has gone down, uh, my Muscle tone has gone up and stayed up, and I'm close to 50 years old. That's an important identifier. Realize that my body's changing from my 30-year physical form to my 50-year form and, and beyond. You know, I'm looking at 60, 70, 80, 90 years. What is it going to take for me to live that long and stay healthy and still active in the hunting community? Um, and But one of the biggest changes in my metabolic history is a significant reduction in my bad cholesterol and an increase in my ratio between the bad and the good cholesterol. Um, Dr. Coker is my collaborator and partner in this endeavor, and he's gonna talk a lot more specifically about some of those changes. Um, but the what of why you're here is really, I've been focused on energy requirements, and that's something that Dr. Coker is also super interested in, and he has decades of experience working in that field. I have decades of experience thinking about that field. So us joining forces is a good, good way for me to get in the field and do these exercises and he can talk about the specific changes and the adaptations that occur. 
our discussions about this energy expenditure and the health benefits began about three years ago and uh, we decided in 2017 to design and implement a field study. So basically the, what that entails is he arms me with the science and what I need to do in the field and I go there and capture video of the process of us hunting and expending energy and all the while he's testing um, various methods like your analysis and uh, body fat composition. You'll learn all of that at the end, closer to the end of this presentation. Um, but to start this off, um, just to let you know, most of our data collection started in our headquarters in Fairbanks, Alaska through the University of Alaska. Um, the Institute of Arctic Biology has been instrumental and that's where his uh, base is and he developed the, what we're calling the Coker Lab where we have an MRI, a DEXA scan, various scientific instruments and processes that actually give us some real answers and not just subjective um, translate from a treadmill trying to trying to compare a lab setting versus a field setting. What we're learning is it's a very different scenario and it produces very different results for your body. So the why of why you're here is um, basically I wanted to cover some uncover some of the physiological benefits of hunting because my my blood chemistry and, and fat levels have have fluctuated based on this lifestyle so there's something to it i've just never had the science to be able to say definitively this is why you're having these changes and this is what it means um, that's where dr coger and his team come in play um, i also wanted to define more clearly for my audience um, they they knew me starting out here in alaska 28 years old you know by all accounts, I was a stud back then, but I wasn't. I just thought I was. Today, I realize that I'm more fit 20 years later than I was in my late 20s and early 30s, and it's a direct result of this lifestyle. So part of this first 30 minutes, you're going to basically experience what a hard float hunt looks like and what kind of labor is involved in, in activities like we pursue in the, in the outdoors. But ultimately, the whole purpose of why I went to Dr. Coker is I wanted to always reduce the weight of my kit, but specifically my food kit. And there's what I noticed was there's um, if you if you compared food weight to body fat, there's a three to four times uh, inefficient rate of food compared to body fat. The question is your body you're, you're carrying let's say you're carrying 10 extra pounds of weight. Well, how much? How many k-calories does that 10 extra pounds equate to in food weight that you would have to bring to the field to prevent that 10 pounds weight loss? Uh, today, I don't have 10 pounds to lose, so I'm hypercritical about that, that efficiency rate. And food really today is not that efficient compared to how much we carry on our bones that we can shed in the field. So this knowledge is allowing me to basically reduce the weight of my food kit in a safer manner so that it, one, doesn't reduce my strength or resilience in the backcountry. How well a hunter performs in the backcountry is largely a measure of movement ability and energy requirement. Tonight is chili mac with beef, 575 cows for mine. The movement constancy required to get the job done in the field is often intense and exhausting because we're using muscles beyond our comfort zone. Not surprisingly, by day four or five, we generally feel stronger and more energetic as a result of our backcountry muscle adaptation given hard work, adequate food, and periods of rest to recover. Those who perform well in the field have adapted their muscles with routines that result in a generally acceptable state of physical readiness, and they pack and manage adequate food supply to fuel their efforts. But what does this muscle adaptation require? What does it mean to be physically ready? How many calories do we actually need each day to exit the field in peak health and strength? And more importantly, how does our body respond and adapt to backcountry hunting? These are the questions my friends and I are answering here today, and we're using field experience and the scientific method to get the answers. Subterranean, baby. <sighs> Our muscles adapt to daily movements and levels of physical activity, and they perform to those demands pretty well. But if we don't adequately prepare those hibernating muscle groups using the principles of intensity, duration, overload, and specificity, 
to build resilience in the backcountry, performance will suffer and total energy requirement will be greater. For me, it's best to eat two, three, 350 calories over a couple of hours. Keeps my sustaining energy up. But the more you eat, the more you need to drink. And I'm almost out of water. We're a mile from fresh water. Could be as much as two hours. Whether you go a field ready or just willing is largely determined by your training discipline throughout the year leading up to that expedition. If you want to build strength and endurance for backcountry hunting, training must match the expected activity's intensity, duration, overload, and specificity. In doing so, your body will be ready to challenge rather than dreading each morning on a long, hard hunt. So my goal is to uh, walk as slowly as I can, try not to burn any more energy than I have to, uh, drink a lot of water, probably a gallon today, and uh, eat a couple hundred calories every two hours. Right now I've had, from for breakfast, I had the bagel and uh, butter, 300 calories, a couple hundred calories in cake, um, that breakfast burrito, you know, it's 800 calories, that milkshake, uh, you know, 1300 calories plus half of that burger, so 200 calories, that's, you know, I'm already working on 1500 calories, and it's only 1245, so start dragging and see how the rest of the day looks. I'm about to lay out the chronology of day one of a 12-day hunt study where my directive was to capture the physical demands of a backcountry adventure on a difficult scale. I'm interested in the complexities of muscle adaptation and total energy expenditure. In other words, how to stay fit and know what nutritional demands I really need. This information not only informs me on critical energy control measures, but it also arms me with skills to safely reduce the weight of my food kit without compromising my metabolic health and total body strength. My body weight starting this trip was 194.6 pounds. I'll weigh 190 12 days later. I managed this arduous solo adventure with minimal weight loss and the lightest possible food kit, about 35 pounds of provisions that supplied roughly 3,500 kcals each day. What I know going into this hunt based on our first health study is that I'll be operating with a 35 to 40 percent calorie deficit restricted by the weight of my food kit. This fact alone will challenge my mental clarity, physical stamina, hydration capacity, and recovery periods. In traveling solo, I can expect to burn 10 to 15 percent more calories every day. What I don't know going into this hunt is how my blood chemistry and body composition will be adapted by this 12-day event. But you're about to learn all this and more as a result of all of our studies. I've been here at this site for two hours since my last meal and you can already figure I'm burned a little over 250 calories just getting ready. Uh, in two hours to go so you can start to measure the importance of caloric intake as you uh, realize caloric demand out here pretty damn quick all right you get the idea of what the what the portage scenario looks like and what kind of uh chore it is to drag uh, my target is a dry part of the creek half a mile away it might have enough water to inflate the boat, otherwise I'm dragging until I find floatable water. But a half mile one way means one mile in return to grab the other load. And another half mile back. So, you know, starting off the trip to, to get to floatable water might be a couple of miles.
Specificity. Alterations that prime our bodies for movement efficiency and capacity begin at the molecular level. The changes that take place are precisely tied to the activity itself. In other words, bicep curls do not increase the strength of our heart muscle or legs. On the other hand, running does not increase the strength of our biceps. Muscles and the molecular machinery that govern their operation adapt specifically to the nature of the exercise stress. Physical training should stress the muscles how they are expected to perform in the field. If you are planning to hunt in the mountains, you had better run, walk, or hike up some hills. If you are planning to do a backpack hunt, you had better strengthen your core for the grind. If you're dragging a sled, don't train with a backpack. Training without the rule of specificity wastes a lot of time. Duration refers to the length of an event and is characterized by the use of rhythmic large muscle groups performed for an extended duration of time. Granted, it is difficult to include this important factor in our training on an appropriate scale because really who has time for three to five hours of moderate exercise each day? Duration plays a key role in the physiological and psychological toll a hunt forces onto the hunter. A common bush day of moderate activity can last 7 to 12 hours, which requires a lot of calories and adequate rest to prevail strong after 10 to 14 days. About uh, 15 minutes into it, feels like I've been on a VO2 max machine. My target heart rate's probably pretty damn close to triple digits. Intensity refers to how hard an event is and how much energy is expended when exercising. Intensity decides what fuel the body uses and what kind of adaptations occur after exercise. In a backcountry setting, the goal usually involves minimizing intensity by increasing duration at a less intense pace to conserve caloric expenditure and consumption, as well as manage more effective hydration. But here's a science fact you'll want to remember. Under intensity, nearly all the energy requirement comes from carbohydrate usage. But with duration, fats are used as energy. Therefore, the higher the intensity, the more food you have to eat, and the more you must also drag along with you. It's a good reminder to myself that uh, at 15 minutes has been a rigorous pace, and I'm starting to sweat, feel the heat in my waders, and uh, my forearms are starting to sweat, so I need to back off on the RPMs and uh, slow this perspiration down. I maintain my hydration, fluid volume, heart rate, calorie expenditure. Just after a few minutes of slowing my RPMs, <clears throat> to a manageable pace count. My breathing's under control. My perspiration has stopped or slowed, and I'm conserving energy. Well, I got the uh, first load back, and just trying to get my get my breath and. Cool down just a little bit, let some of the sweat chill and repeat that same route with the lessons I learned from the first 30 minutes, which is take it easy, take it slow, try to keep from sweating as much as possible, and uh, get her done. I'll be there and back in about an hour probably, so I'm not going to take the camera. You can just imagine the same thing I just accomplished. Just an hour and a half of that kind of effort. We'll see how it goes. Alright. <clears throat> so, got an hour and a half behind me and got all my gear here. That second load was a snap. And, uh, 
So that's an hour and a half of that kind of activity. Now I'm gonna get that raft inflated. And I brought such a small air pump, I'm gonna get quite a arm workout. So I'm probably gonna burn some calories and shed some of this clothing so I can get some aerobic activity going real quick. A little uh, natural resistance training. Well, I've been at this piston piston throws for 15 minutes, half the boat's inflated. Muscles have an exceptional ability to adapt to increased resistance or load. They increase their strength through adaptations in size and neural efficiency when they are forced to contract at tensions close to their maximum. The overload must be progressively increased for consistent gains in strength to occur. However, to avoid overstressing muscle groups, an approach known as periodization training is very important. This approach switches workouts from arms and shoulders to exercises involving the lower legs and core muscle groups, offering periods of rest in between workouts for overloaded muscles. That was half an hour. Got a 13 foot boat that uh, is capable of hauling me and Chachi, all my expedition gear, and one bull moose under the right water scenario. Maybe a caribou on top of that, but I don't think we're going to get away with that depth on this trip unless we get some rain. The river looked, the creek looked pretty parched from the air. Take a short rest, get gear packed up in this boat on the edge of the water and float over to the next drag spot. Start looking for a camp. I use periodization as a goal-oriented training method all year long to prepare my backcountry muscles for August and September. For me, winter involves dedicated Nordic skiing with an overall body training stimulus, while summer months are devoted to running, rafting, and just staying active. In all seasons, a day of rest between exercise events gives me the greatest feelings of overall strength and readiness. These cycles of overload require adequate rest and quality nutrition, as well as a focus on the specific muscle groups that will see the most action in the field. Subterranean, baby. <sighs> it's only about eight miles of this pull and riffle. And the, uh, gradually, the riffles hopefully will not be bone fucking dry. <sighs> Look at it disappearing under the rocks. Oh, this is going to be fun. The next six minutes will highlight the real world movement constancy and duration of a long, hard day in the field. At this point, I have about three hours of physical work behind me and five hours of dragging ahead. This one's going to suck. About 100 yards subterranean. I want you to imagine what training exercises you could do to replicate this kind of work and which muscle groups are required to move downstream to a happier place. And try to estimate how many calories you think I'll burn in eight hours. Don't worry, it's not a test. We've got some answers for you.
That, my friends, was a chore. Chotky knows what's up with Flow Dragon. She don't get to ride in the boat. She's like, yep, this. <laughs> this. Get your quad workout, boy. I'm just gonna uh, relax my expectations and let the river show me where it wants me to camp tonight. Whatever I have to do to get down this river safely, I wanna tap into that energy. So I'm gonna just plug along. I think I wanna eat a, maybe eat a bagel real quick and get a, another 240, 50 calories in me. Try to find camp. Nearly four hours into it. It's almost eight o'clock. I don't have any more energy. It's slipping and falling and I gotta stop before I injure myself. Cause uh, it ain't getting any better for a while. How close was your guess for calorie expenditure? Remember, I only brought enough food to supply 3,500 kcals each day, which means that I was likely already deficient at least 1,500 kcals on day one. Since one pound of body fat equals roughly 3,500 kcals, my weight loss trend had officially begun. At this rate, I would lose one pound of body fat every 2.3 days, or a total projected weight loss of 5.2 pounds in 12 days. It may not be obvious in my presence, but trust that I knew I had to carefully manage my energy expenditure to minimize total weight loss. 
This trend was unacceptable for me. For me, that strategy begins 12 months before every hunt cycle. I stay fit so that my body is thinking nothing of a backcountry hunt. It's just another day in the life of these muscles. So I burn calories more efficiently and more predictably. Gotta get some dinner in me once we get a tent set up. Dropping. <coughs> well, it's 8.30 and 39 degrees. <coughs> Dropping pretty fast. Gonna have me some wine. That's three, three liters today, three quarts. Give me about 500 calories right there. I appreciate that. And Vino Veritas. That's right. Lasagna with meat sauce, 14 grams of protein. About 480 plus 120, so five, 600 calories. If I eat the whole thing, I'm not sure I can. I'll give it a shot. So between that and the wine, be pushing 11,000 to 1,100 calories. Just saw a blow fly. Made me think of the temperature. So, uh, knowing that they come out at 50 degrees, check my thermometer, it showed 52 quite a contrast from this morning so that tells me that the moose that are around here are going to be bedded down right now it's almost a 30 30 degree temperature variance from 6 a.m. to 2 o'clock in the afternoon or 3 o'clock in the afternoon so I'm not expecting any activity right now but about 8 o'clock when it cools down sharply I think we're going to have some activity with any luck and if not maybe in the morning Right now I'm just conserving calories and uh, patiently waiting. Backcountry hunting is really all about energy control. Afternoon of day six. And my focus will be lasered onto calorie management, hydration, injury prevention, and rest. Rest is mandatory for recovery, but for me it's all about reducing weight loss. I know that I'll lose four pounds on this trip which averages out to a loss of about one pound every three days, or a calorie deficit of about 1,100 kcals per day. That would mean an additional 15 pounds of food weight required just to break even on kcals, and that's just not gonna happen on an expedition like this. So rest days have to factor into my expeditions. Still waiting on moose. <clears throat> Breakfast skillet, mountain house. Pretty good. A little Cholula would make it nice. Chachi loves it. Go ahead. You like that dirt? Get you some dirt. Suck up a couple of those gnats. What I've learned out here about gnats, <clears throat> 40 degrees is the magic number. For mosquitoes and blowflies, it's 50 degrees. We're at 43 degrees right now, and I'm counting down the minutes till those fucking gnats leave me alone. I've sucked so many up my nose, it's pissing me off. <clears throat> but this burrito makes me feel all the better. Oh yeah. I'll bring it on, Moosey. You might question how I can so accurately estimate my own calorie expenditure 
and predictable weight loss in such an unpredictable environment and workload. Measuring energy expenditure is just one component of the health studies we're about to discuss. Dr. Robert Coker is an associate professor of clinical nutrition and exercise physiology at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. He's also my collaborator in this endeavor and is the right person to lead the best part of this presentation, the energy requirements and metabolic benefits of wilderness hunting in Alaska. Thank you for that entertainment, Larry. I like watching all that video. Um, uh, my, just a little bit about my background. Some of you came in after Larry got started. Uh, I've been at the University of Alaska Fairbanks for going on six years now. Um, I got my PhD over 20 years ago in exercise physiology. Um, I've done, I don't know, 20 something, like I say, 20 something years of, of research, clinical research, and uh, studying lifestyle interventions uh, and people that are probably in the worst metabolic health, uh, all the way from, to athletes that are in the, the best absolute athletic condition or best physical condition you can imagine, including just recently we finished our third year working with the, some of the athletes in the Yukon Arctic Ultra. If you don't know anything about that event, it's 430 miles uh, held obviously in early February. Uh, it takes about two weeks for them to do it. They have to drag their own pulp the whole time. It's almost completely unsupported. So the point is that I've got experience in, from the worst case scenario with respect to metabolic health to the absolute best case scenario and you know Larry and I started talking a few years ago uh, about some of the these issues especially as they, as they relate to backcountry hunting um, and I think that there's two really important questions there's probably more than two questions that are important but there's two questions that we were really interested in and one was what is the energy expenditure in a backcountry hunt and that can obviously take all kinds of different shapes forms and sizes the initial study that we got involved in was a um, uh, a less arduous example than what uh, the, the video showed this morning uh, and the one that he just went over is probably a, a worst case example at least for a float hunt um, and that there's a tremendous amount of caloric expenditure he was on a solo hunt by himself so he really had to make sure he was making the right decisions um, so not just a physical stress but a lot of mental stress as well um, and then now we're starting to, you know, we're interested obviously in some other types of hunting like sheep hunting, mount, more mountain oriented hunting. And each one of those examples is an unscripted example of physical activity. Uh, in other words, and Larry kind of mentioned that a little bit, uh, but I think that the base, the first question we wanted to answer is what is the energy expenditure in these uh, types of uh, environments? And then the second question, I'll get to both of these, is what are the metabolic health or what are the health benefits? So we wanted to investigate both of those things and one, energy expenditure or what is the amount of energy expenditure? And then the second, what are the metabolic health benefits? And so we just kind of go through some of those.
<laughs> Keeping track of a lot of science data and uh, presenting a lot of information on this trip, so it should be interesting. So that's 28 and a half pounds. And one of those chores is to uh, perform a calorie count of everything we eat out here as we eat it, or at least by the end of the day, have a good tally of what we've eaten. And uh, we're going to use that information as part of a backcountry hunting health study. In this particular study, we assess both caloric intake and caloric expenditure. Caloric intake, as Larry's talking about here a little bit, is is relatively easy. We knew how much the people were taking in, how much these hunters were taking into the field, and we knew how much they were taking out. They're somewhat of a captive audience, captive being they were captive in the backcountry. Um, and then they also recorded how, mu how much, uh, how many calories that they were uh, using. Well, it's 7.15 and uh, I just had breakfast and collected my second void of the morning. So the way this thing works is Within the first hour from your first void, uh, you take a urine sample and we collect that. And today's date is 08, 08, or 09, 08, 2017. Write down the time and then throw it in our little baggie. By the end of the trip, we'll have a whole mess of that urine and hopefully none of the caps will fall off. I was going to say, I hope we don't have a mess of urine. <laughs> Keeping track of our calorie counts during the day as we talked about and uh, our physical activity level if we can remember it. Mm, good old science journal. 33 degrees this morning at 7 o'clock. Okay so Larry mentioned something about the collection of the, these urine samples. You're probably thinking what what does that have to do with caloric expenditure? Well, I mentioned real briefly about you can't really, you can't really, or you at least can't very easily assess energy expenditure in the backcountry because it's unscripted. It's difficult to, to do that using an accelerometer because of changes in, in load carriage. And so I knew about this technique that um, I've, I've used this, this, these tools called stable isotopes for 20 years to literally trace carbohydrate, fat, and protein metabolism. And there's one particular approach where you can use something called doubly labeled water, which sounds really complicated, maybe, or kind of funny, but it just means that the, la the hydrogen is labeled and the oxygen is labeled. So you can trace both of them. You can follow both of them through the body. And so this enables us to capture um, very comprehensively all the components of energy expenditure, resting, thermic effect of feeding, or the energy expenditure associated with digestion, non-exercise activity thermogenesis or the, the production of heat um, and exercising ex energy expenditure. So it gets everything. It's like a, a net that nothing can escape. Yeah, if you look at this little figure, this uh, relatively rotund fellow, you can see just what I just described and that is we give the dose of the W label water and then we have uh, the individuals like the participants in this study collect their urine and then we can measure the, the label and the, the hydrogen label and the oxygen label uh, and has, as the oxygen label is incorporated in CO2. And you say, well, what does that mean? How does that, how does that help you or how does that enable you to measure energy expenditure? Well, here's how it does it. You measure the difference between the loss of the oxygen label and the loss of the hydrogen label. In other words, the faster you lose the oxygen label, that's more proportional, proportional to an increase in energy expenditure. The hydrogen label comes off at a solid and very predictable level, but the oxygen label, its incorporation into carbon dioxide production rates, uh, enables a ca calculation of total energy expenditure. So the point is, is no matter how the person might try to influence it or might change it, the only way they could really screw it up would be to pour water in the urine or something like that, which is not going to happen. So anyway, this is a really important slide that I wanted to show you. These light gray bars. Uh, represent caloric expenditure or energy expenditure. The dark ones represent energy intake. And you can see that there's a negative caloric balance of about 2,200 calories a day. Even in this less arduous example of, of, of energy expenditure and a negative caloric balance. And so predictably, when you see a, a negative energy balance of somewhere around 2,000 calories, that's very, very good, very facilitative in terms of improving um, metabolic health. 
And so a couple of things that we did is you just saw this real briefly, the scanner that we had in the back in that real quick video um, that enables us to very accurately assess changes in body composition. Okay, and in this, in this particular study, in the four individuals that completed this, they lost a significant amount of body weight. Um, they retained all their lean tissue mass, which that means their muscle, all their organ systems are completely uh, retained. Um, but they lost a significant, and predictably lost a significant amount of fat tissue and a significant, significant amount of visceral fat. And visceral fat is that fat that's inside your abdominal cavity that you can't really pinch, but it's the worst kind of fat in terms of increasing the risk of, of metabolic disease. Using a DEXA scan for that? Yes, sir. Yeah. And so here's Larry Getter, one of our research participants, getting into a, <laughs> you didn't recognize that guy, did you? Getting into a, a, our MRI, or magnetic, magnetic resonance imaging scanner. And the importance of this particular part of the uh, data presentation is that lean tissue mass helps us kind of get at what's happening in terms of skeletal muscle, but it doesn't measure it very precisely. And the MRI does exactly that. In this particular case, we took a, a measurement of the cross-sectional area of the skeletal muscle, um, quadriceps and hamstrings, and then we also measure something called liver fat, which is the fat that's stored in the liver. You can see this slide here uh, very precisely, uh, a delineation of the quadricep and delineation of hamstrings, and we found out that there was no change in muscle mass in the leg even with a significant amount of weight loss, even with that level of caloric expenditure. And so it's just really, I think, very interesting because if you look at a lot of the popular lay literature out there, it's, it's almost like if you miss your protein drink at the end of your workout, then you're just gonna shed all this muscle. And that's fundamentally not true. Now, does, does protein intake after resistance exercise help you gain muscle? Absolutely. But if you're talking about maintaining muscle in the backcountry, um, as long as you don't drop typically below, or as long as you don't go above 2,500 calories and negative caloric balance, then you're generally in pretty good shape. And there's a recent review article that's been published that covers about 15 different uh, studies uh, that were done uh, using military operation scenarios, and they really corroborate that same thing or provide some of the same evidence. If you start to get above 3,000 calories and negative caloric balance, then you might start to see some muscle atrophy or, or loss of skeletal muscle. But within this range, it's, it's pretty well titrated. And then one of the things that is most interesting to me, being an expert in metabolic disease, is that there was a reduction in intrahepatic lipid or liver lipid in every single hunter. And you can see in this particular uh, figure, even the individual with the largest amount of liver fat and the individual with the very smallest amount of liver fat, every single one of them lost intrahepatic lipid. You say, well, what is intrahepatic lipid? Well, your liver does a lot of different things. And one of the things that it's in charge of is maintaining the appropriate amount of lipids in your circulation. And so it's kind of like, in some ways, almost like a, a pond that accumulates things and releases them. And in a healthy liver, you'd have a pond where a beaver could never really build a dam. You'd always have fat leaking out in the circulation and that would work out just fine because the, it would continue to flow on downstream or using the analogy, using that analogy applied to the human condition, that fat would be oxidized, that fat would be used. But an individual that is not doing much physical activity and eating a lot of fat, that beaver, that they have, uh, uh, the analogy would be a, a really good core of beavers that keeps that dam very well built and then a tremendous amount of flow coming into that system where it just expands and gets bigger and bigger and bigger and larger and so you get this accumulation of liver fat. You say, well, what's so bad about that? The liver's keeping it out of the circulation. Well, what's bad about that is that sets up an inflammatory process in the liver that increases the risk of metabolic disease. And one of the, th one of the reasons why it does that is it tends to resort or tends to lead to elevations in blood glucose or, or blood sugar. So the whole, the whole point of saying all that is this is really a remarkable finding. And studies have been done in, in individuals that uh, had a lot more liver fat to lose uh, over 12 to 20 weeks of physical activity interventions and dietary interventions and still didn't lose this amount of liver fat. So this is really remarkable data.
And then we also did a VO2 peak test on a bicycle. We're going to follow up with some uh, further studies on a treadmill where we can try to replicate some of the things a little bit better to what's actually taking place in the backcountry. We've published this uh, data in a journal called Physiological Reports, which is a peer, which is a peer-reviewed scientific journal. We also uh, presented this data at the American College of Sports Medicine meeting uh, last year in Indianapolis, Indiana. This is a friend of mine, Brent Ruby, that I've known for like 25 years that helped us with the uh, with the doubly labeled water technique. And this is, of course, my lovely wife, who also she would argue did most of the work. <coughs> and then we also did a VO2 peak test. On a bicycle, we're going to follow up with some uh, further studies on a treadmill where we can try to replicate some of the things a little bit better to what's actually taking place in the backcountry. We've published this uh, data in a journal called Physiological Reports, which is a peer, which is a peer-reviewed scientific journal. We also uh, presented this data at the American College of Sports Medicine meeting uh, last year in Indianapolis, Indiana. This is a friend of mine, Brent Ruby, that I've known for like 25 years that helped us with the uh, with the doubly labeled water technique, and this is, of course, my lovely wife, who also, she would argue, did most of the work. <laughs> yeah, this is okay, just, a, just the credits to give up. Okay. So we just follow up the end of the talk with, there's some other people that helped us, including some folks from the University of Wisconsin, with the analysis of the, the doubly labeled water. dragging a wrap through this. And you wonder why the cord's 43 inches? Good shot, brother. Uh, I hope that you gleaned the, 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 the answers to the questions that I posed initially, and that is, what is the energy expenditure? Well, it's about 4,000 calories, or about twice what we typically would utilize in a given day. Um, and it's about 2,000 calories uh, represented by the physical activity in and of itself. And to put that in perspective, if you think about getting on the treadmill, the last time you've been on the treadmill running or whatever, uh, generally speaking, many people in relatively decent physical condition can utilize about a thousand calories an hour, uh, depending on their body type. I mean, guard, you know, a person that's 180, not a, a male, that's 180, 190 pounds, that's about what they're going to burn. 
Um, so that puts that in perspective. That means two or three times the amount that you would normally see uh, with a generally a, a, an hour a day of aerobic activity is a significant amount. Most people don't have time to run for three hours on the treadmill, even if they would like to. And then the second thing is the metabolic can tell you, after doing a number of different lifestyle interventions uh, over my career, these are the most profound results I've seen. Um, and that includes studies that have lasted as long as 20 weeks and individuals that have had a whole lot more room for improvement. And generally speaking, in science, if you see room for improvement, that just gives you a better level of gain to actually invoke that improvement. And so these guys are in relatively good physical condition, but still improve dramatically. So thank you very much. I appreciate your attention. And answer any questions you might have, both of us, from both of us.